Good morning, Wellspring. It's great to see each and every one of you. So let's stand and worship our God together this morning. Sing this with me before the throne. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. The great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and waits for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me then see part. No tongue can bid me then see part. Sing tips. Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied To look on Him and pardon me To look on Him and pardon me Behold Him there, the risen Lamb My perfect spotless righteousness The great unchangeable I am the King of glory and of grace. One with Himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God. Because a sinless Savior died. My sinful soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me, to look on Him and pardon me. Hallelujah. Pray with me this morning, church. Heavenly Father, we, we remember your gospel today, that you have saved us, chosen us, you've brought us near to you through your blood. You are a priest, God. Help us be full of thankfulness this morning as we remember God, and we just pray for the rest of the service. You'd bless our time of worship and music, and you'd bless our time of hearing the word, Lord. I really do pray that you bless our meeting tonight as we, uh, as we come back and, and watch a video together, Lord. I just pray that you would use it all for your glory. You would use it all to build your church to strengthen her, to, to increase her covenant with one another, Lord. Just help us this morning. We love you. Our eyes are on you this morning, Lord. We just want to see your will be done here as it is in heaven. We ask that in your name. And everybody said, amen. Let's greet each other this morning. I cry to you in darkest places I will call incline your ear to me anew and hear my cry for mercy Lord were you to count my sinful ways how could I come before your throne Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze. I stand redeemed by grace alone. I'll wait. I will wait for you. I will wait for you on your word. I will rely. I will wait for you. Surely wait for you. My soul is satisfied. Put your hope. 
So put your hope in God alone. Take courage in His power to say, completely and forever one. By Christ emerging from the grave, I will wait for love has made a way and God himself has paid the price that all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice that all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice I will wait for you, I will wait for you through the storm and through the night. I will wait for you, surely wait for you, for your love is my delight. I will I 
rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other, the soul is satisfied in Him alone.
Massive, massive truths. Help our unbelief, God. Help us to trust you in all things. Help us to trust in your name, Lord. For you are the beginning and the end. You are the ancient of days. You are the one who is before all, after all. It is you. So, Lord, help us trust in your power now as we transition to hearing from your word, Lord. Apply to our hearts. Do a mighty work by your spirit that we could never do in 10,000 years of striving in human effort, God. We need you. We need you, Lord. Apply these truths to our hearts, Lord. Make us right before you. Give us a clear mind. Help us to be a discerning, wise people, Lord, who live off of the bread of life. You, Christ, through your very words. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for this morning. Thank you for a sweet time of singing corporately with the saints, God. Now we just pray that you would bless us once again with more of your truth applied to our hearts and minds. We ask that in your name. And everybody said, amen. May I have a seat. Good morning. We are in Isaiah this morning, Isaiah chapter 1. And I think if you're using a house Bible, it is page 672. We're going to be uh, reading verses 10 through 20, Isaiah 1, verses 10 through 20. If you can, can I have you stand for the reading of the word this morning? Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom, give ear to the law of our Lord, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of the lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meetings. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. 
They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, humble our hearts to have the good soil, receptive ground for your truth. And speak through me and where I err, God, I pray that you would remove that from their minds and only your truth would be planted deep to feed their souls, to bring conviction, to transform all of us, Lord, into the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to become more like him today, purify and sanctify your bride and bring us into greater biblical obedience to you in the day and age that we live. That's our heart's desire, God. Do that work. We look to you for it now. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, I, um, just to prepare you, not to apologize, but to prepare you, we're going to go a little longer today. And uh, I did apologize to the nursery staff, but no apologizing in here, right? Um, but uh, what, what I want to talk about this morning, um, this might be the only time some of you will ever hear some of this truth get exposed. And so I want to take the time to try to sufficiently go through as much as I can. Um, we did just mark last week the 49th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, of five decades of legalized murder of the most innocent in our society. And last week, we looked at the doctrine of blood guiltiness. And Lord willing, your eyes were opened to the terrifying plight our nation finds itself in for its innocent bloodshed. We looked at the reality of national sins, bringing national judgment, and the reality that the greatest national security threat to America is God. It's God. And you might say this morning, God hasn't judged us yet. I mean, we've got five decades of this, and we must be doing something right that God would have spared us his judgment this, all this time. God is merciful and gracious, but he has not spared America judgment these five decades because of anything we've been doing right. I will say that. I want to talk about what is the right Christian response to the abortion holocaust. What is the biblical response? What's the responsibility of the church? What should a Christian do? And when I say that, you might ask, well, what is the Christian response? You mean be pro-life, not pro-choice, right? And by pro-life, you mean support the pregnancy center and vote Republican, right? No. That is not what I mean by the Christian response to the abortion holocaust. In fact, I believe as we look at the scriptures and examine the pro-life industry, what we're going to find is that it is absolutely not the Christian response. Christians haven't, haven't failed to be pro-life enough. They failed to be Christian enough. We, we need to examine the response biblically, and, and you may have heard me say things like this before about the pro-life movement, but we, we want, I want to properly teach and equip us this morning so you can see it for yourself from the Scripture. We want to examine today is the pro-life movement biblical? And, and if not, then what, what should the church be doing? What would be the biblical response that we should be about in our culture? Isn't, isn't it a good question to ask? What's the biblical response? 
Shouldn't we be willing to examine everything in our lives by the question of, is it biblical? Through the lens of Scripture, should we not be willing to humble ourselves and evaluate everything through the, the Bible? Or do we have sacred cows that, that we're not even willing to, to have questioned. We're just immediately offended that it's even being questioned. And even if you were to properly present the biblical case, I wouldn't believe it anyways because this is my sacred cow. And that's what we mean by sacred cow. It's so entrenched. It's, it's such a tradition that, that we, we can't think any other way and we just put up our guard. Now, I think five decades of run-of-the-mill pro-lifeism has become a sacred cow in the church of Jesus Christ, evidenced by the way many have responded to any questioning of it in the last few years here at Wellspring. And I hope, I hope and pray that that, that will not be you today. Some of you might feel like this is the last straw for you, and you've tolerated a lot of change in this church over the last few years, and, and, then, and this is just too far. But I'm praying God gives you eyes to see. I'm praying God's merciful on us that we would have hearts to receive the truth. It would seem in God's sovereign wisdom, He has brought a partial hardening upon many to these truths. Just like He does Israel during the time of the Gentiles. A partial hardening has come upon the people. It would seem God, for His wise and sovereign purposes, has brought a partial hardening on His own people. May that not be us. We, we pray for mercy. We pray God give us eyes to see and be merciful to us to know the truth in the matter. Every Christian must be willing to examine everything about their life and beliefs and activities by the teaching of Scripture. That was the sermon I did, Sola Scriptura, right? That is a foundation of this church. And we're going to be faithful and consistently applying that right now. So I want to look at the Scriptures and put it side by side with the pro-life response and, Lord willing, show you that what God calls Christians to is not in joining with the pro-life industry, but, but to be a biblical abolitionist, an abortion abolitionist. I am not pro-life. I am an abolitionist. And there is a major distinction that I hope to show you the difference today biblically. And so the big idea for your, note, your notes, abortion abolitionism is the biblical pursuit of immediate and equal justice for the unborn as we bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into conflict with the culture of death. The biblical pursuit of immediate and equal justice for the unborn as we bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into, cult, into the conflict with the culture of death. And some of you, and bless your heart, right? You look at that and think, isn't that pro-life? And I praise God that if that's where you stand right now, you're, you're in the truth, but you've been deceived about who you've been joining with. Abolitionism is founded on five tenets. Five foundations. I want to look at the ideology of it this morning. And these five tenets are in direct contrast to an aspect of the pro-life movement. And we need to understand, I, I think we have yoked ourselves to an unbiblical, secular, humanistic, pragmatic, compromised work of the wisdom of man that is doomed to fail and has failed for 50 years. And the churches yoked themselves to that movement. And it might seem strange to you today that we're not dealing with pro-choice arguments. We're, we're dealing with pro-life arguments and strategies. But that is because what is standing in the way of abolishing abortion today is the pro-life industry. I know that's an extreme statement. I pray you stay with me because if it's true then that truth needs to get exposed, right? And we need to look at that through the Scriptures. Number one, abortion abolitionism is founded on the Bible. Abortion abolitionism is founded on the Bible. An abolitionist is one who is supremely submitted to the authority and sufficiency of Scripture for everything. Sola Scriptura, right? Isaiah 40, verse 8, we know that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, our God, will stand forever. This is what we trust, right? And so this means that our understanding of abortion is grounded in biblical theology. 
And we understand abortion is wrong because it is murder. It's a breaking of the sixth commandment. God tells us this. And we understand that abortion is wrong because it's not just the ending of a potential life, but it is the murder of a human that is made uniquely in the image of God. And what makes the, the, ba the baby so valuable, that, that it's so wrong to end its life, what gives the baby its value? It's that the baby is made in the image of God, just like you and I are. Okay? What makes murder so horrendous? It's that it's the destruction of an image bearer of God. That's our theological starting point. We get that from the Scriptures. Genesis 9, verse 6, we looked at last week. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. That's what makes murder so wrong. That's our, our starting point. We get that from the Scripture. Now, in contrast to this, the pro-life industry is founded on a humanistic worldview, without God's word, without God's truth as its standard for, for, for morality and authority and truth. Humanism is an ever-shifting sand because mankind is mutable and always changing, and man makes his own standards, his own morality, based on science and reason, right? Or the, you know, judging the wind of culture and which way it's going. Okay, that, that makes the pro-life movement doomed to fail from the outset because they are building their house on the sand instead of the rock of obedience to God's Word. If the Word isn't your foundation, it's doomed to fail. And so you need to understand they do this intentionally. And a lot of what I'm going to say today, listen, I'm not attacking every pro-lifer. I'm, I'm talking about pro-life industry, the leadership, a lot of the politicians Pro-life leaders will say explicitly, don't bring the Bible into the conversation. You can't do that, okay? It won't work. We, we got to find some common ground to reach them. Use science. Uh, appeal to their emotions. Appeal to their reasoning from a, a neutral starting point with them. But Jesus says what? There is no neutrality. Matthew 12, 30. Whoever's not with me is against me, right? But pro-life leadership boasts that Quote, you don't have to be religious to be pro-life, to be a part of what we're doing, right? And, and they've built their whole movement from this ecumenical starting point that basically says it doesn't matter if you have a biblical worldview, come be a part of what we're doing. You can be transgenders for life. You can be atheists for life. You can be feminists for life. You can be Roman Catholic for life, Mormon for life, pedophiles for life. We're a big tent, it's an ecumenical thing. Anyone who's going to have the same goal, being pro-life, the same messaging and goal, then you can be pro-life. One Students for Life organization boasts of a transgender pro-life activist coming in and tra tra training their children. They boast of that. Look how inclusive we are. You know, we need all these people because we need as many people as possible to end abortion, right? And so they're this big ecumenical thing. Now, you tell me you don't think Someone's worldview matters for how you're going to fight against evil? Does your worldview matter? Somebody who rejects God and thinks that we're all just highly evolved stardust with no absolutes, no, they no longer know if a boy's a boy, if a girl's a girl, right? That doesn't come into play. You remember, we talked about this plenty of times before. There is no such thing as neutrality. Everyone is either a believer in Yahweh or in rebellion to Yahweh. There's no, common, there's no middle ground. Okay? Nobody's neutral. We all have an ultimate authority in our lives for truth and morality. And it's either going to be the Word of God or it's going to be yourself or some other shifting sand, right? God is never going to bless a movement that seeks to keep Him out of it to keep the Bible out of the conversation. God wants His law and gospel proclaimed in the public square, obeyed and believed, and He's commanded the church to proclaim that word and not to compromise with those who want to silence God's word. And we have. We have. Okay, okay, we'll set the Bible aside to be a part of this and, and, and hopefully bring some good. God's not going to bless that. Pro-life movement doesn't start with the Word of God, and so they therefore cannot define when a life starts and why a life is actually sacred. Does a life start and, and, and begin to have value at the moment they take their first breath? 
or at the moment they become viable outside the womb, or at the moment they begin to feel pain, or at the moment they have a heartbeat, right? And why is that life sacred? Again, they don't have a foundation to answer those questions, and that's why you get these incremental bills treating the unborn with partiality. The, with the Bible as our foundation, church, we believe life begins at conception and is sacred because humans are made in the image of God from the moment of conception. That's when it happens, okay? That's when the new life is formed, okay? And, and you want a theological argument for that that you can't argue against? Listen, the Bible says the Son of God took on human flesh in the womb of a virgin Mary. The incarnation, we celebrated at Christmas. You tell me, when did that happen? Was it at the moment of the heartbeat or 20 weeks? When, when did divine, divinity take on humanity in one flesh? At conception. That's when the Son of God entered the world, was at the moment of conception in a single-celled zygote, a baby. So the Bible alone gives us a basis for rational thought, for science, for morality, for absolute truth, for righteous law. We talked about all that. We talked about presuppositional apologetics a couple weeks ago. The Bible is a completely sufficient guide for instructing our politics as well as every other area of our life. Do you understand that? God has something to say about how we go about our politics. As William Wilberforce said, he was the uh, slavery abolitionist of England that over decades finally abolished slavery in England. He said this, we must give an account of our political conduct at the judgment seat of Christ. That drove him. I, I can't do it the world's way. I got to do it God's way. I got to do it God's way because I'm going to give an account to God for how I did politics. You are not going to be judged by how effective you were, but by how biblically faithful you were to Jesus Christ. Did you glorify God first and foremost in all that you did? Contrary to what many think, our first priority is not saving babies. It's not even saving souls. It's what? Glorify God. Glorify God. If that's not first, if you take that out, Suddenly, these goals of souls or babies, you, you can cut some corners. You can find some strategic ways. You can do some evil that good may come, right? But if this is supreme, we start with the Bible, glorify God above all else. That's our highest priority. Well, now we've got to do it God's way. And that, we find, is the only way God is going to bless. That's the biblical worldview that we need, it is not glorifying to God for Christians to leave the Bible out and yoke themselves to some pretended neutrality on secular ground in order so that we could just do whatever we have to do to, to save some life. That's not the Christian response. We're founded on the Bible. Secondly, abortion abolitionism is centered on the gospel. It's centered on the gospel for your notes. As abolitionists, we are attempting to bring the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ into conflict with this culture of death. Meaning, we preach Christ and Him crucified as the answer for all sins. And we believe that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for sinners. And we believe it is the power of God to transforming entire societies. We are not ashamed of the gospel, Romans 1.16. As it would seem, so many in the pro-life movement are ashamed of the gospel. Keeping it out of the conversation. We believe that God's law says abortion is murder and therefore a sin. It's a breaking of God's commandments. What's the answer for sin, church? The gospel. The answer for sin is the gospel. That's why we're evangelizing moms and dads and murder mill employees, and Planned Parenthood employees, right? Because we believe the gospel alone saves and transforms people because what they need is it's repentance, and they need a changed heart. They need that work of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God works to draw sinners to repentance and faith through what? The preaching and the hearing of the gospel. We're not just making practical arguments for why it's better not to kill babies than to kill them. Sure, there's plenty of great arguments for that, right? We are warning People that murders will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. They need to surrender in obedience and faith to Jesus Christ or they'll perish in hell. The gospel's at the center. 
In contrast to this, the pro-life movement has insisted, again, that the gospel will be left out of the conversation. Why? Because we don't want to push people away. We don't want to push people away. It's just, we just reason with them about how much they'll regret it, how much it will hurt them to make this bad decision. We don't call it murder. We don't call it sin, right? Those are things that the gospel can address and forgive. But no, we're going to call it a bad decision, and we're going to tell them that that they'll regret it instead of telling them they, they will be guilty before a holy God for murdering their own child which is the truth they need to hear. Now, most crisis pregnancy centers will follow that same strategy and not preach the gospel to abortion vulnerable women lest they, quote, push them away. This is their terminology, okay? I I sat down with uh, the director of Hope Pregnancy Center here in town a long time ago. Uh, Brother Cal was with me. There was another pastor there that was on the board at the time, and, and we talked about these things, and I heard these same excuses for why they don't bring the gospel front and center. And when I challenged them on why their website speaks of abortion as a, quote, option if you're pregnant, here's your three options for if you're pregnant, what you can do. Instead of saying what God says about it, that it's murder, and that, that they, they defended it as good and necessary so that you can get the women in the door to be able to further minister to them. The ones that we want to reach, we can't reach them with the truth on the website, we got to get them in the door to reach them with the truth. And yet, at the same time, if you're unwilling to tell them what God says before because you think God's truth is impotent and going to push them away, once they come, you're still not going to reach them with God's truth, lest you what? Lest you push them away. Now they're here. We'll find a different way to reach them. And it's, it's crazy to me to think that what's happened to us as a church, that, that we think we're going to somehow reach people and win people by not sharing Christ with them. That's literally where we're at. That's what friendship evangelism has brought us to. We're going to win people without preaching Christ. Right? Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. The gospel is a message of words. It's always necessary to use words. We live holy lives, but we preach the gospel. How can they believe unless they hear? And how can they hear unless someone preaches, right? But we've watered it down, and now we're trying to win people without sharing Christ with them. And we are like doctors with the cure to cancer, but not willing to offer it to people lest they might reject it. And so instead, we try to trick them into doing the right thing. We need to understand that the failure of the pro-life movement to call abortion murder and thus rightly define it as sin leads to a failure then to preach the gospel, the very life-saving message of Jesus who came to die for sinners. Abortion then gets treated as a purely political or social issue that must be fought with carnal, worldly weapons instead of it being a gospel issue that can be fought with spiritual weapons that destroy strongholds and bring all thought into captivity to Jesus Christ. That's the weapons we have with the gospel. You add to this the fact that 90% of the pro-life movement and leadership is made up of Roman Catholics, and you realize they believe a false gospel of works and Mary worship and idolatry, right? So you, you, you start to clearly see that the pro-life movement cannot be gospel-centered because many of them believe and practice a different gospel that Paul calls anathema in Galatians chapter 1, Right? Damned or cursed for believing a false gospel. And so we've yoked ourselves with those God says to divide from Romans 16, 17. Divide from them. That's the word of the Lord for us. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? So abolitionism is centered on the gospel. It's a movement of preaching Christ because we believe that the good news of the kingdom is the answer to all of society's evils. Abortion abolitionism is centered on the gospel. Thirdly, abortion abolitionism is driven by the church. Listen. If abortion is sin, and the answer to sin is the gospel, who has the gospel? The church of Jesus Christ. The church alone 
has the gospel. We're the only organization on earth with the gospel. We are the ones that God has commissioned to preach this gospel. Ending abortion is a responsibility of the church. God has commanded us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to seek justice for the unborn, to, to seek justice for the widow, for the, the orphan, the helpless of society. And only the church of Jesus Christ has the spiritual weapons to combat this demonic evil of child sacrifice. Only the church of Jesus Christ has the power of the Holy Spirit and God's blessing. Pro-life is all-inclusive of atheists, LGBT, other religions and cults. God will not bless their efforts. Nor will He bless His people compromising to partner with false gospels to bring about a good result. The pro-life movement has says that you just need to keep giving your money to the professionals and to the politicians. If you want any hope of ending abortion, let them do it. And so churches have given millions, if not billions of dollars these last five decades to these elites, these politicians, these bigwigs to end abortion for us. Abolitionism says no. No, the church needs to repent of her apathy. And the church needs to rise up and take responsibility of being a consistent voice for the unborn. Because what the culture needs is true repentance. The culture needs a spiritual repentance, a change of heart, right? Not just being tricked into accepting one tenet of the Christian faith, you shall not murder. That's not our goal, right? The, the only hope is mass spiritual repentance, and that can only be driven by the people of God. And so that means repentance starts with the people of God. As we lead the way, as Francis Schaeffer has said, every abortion mill needs a sign out front that says, open by permission of the church. Schaeffer said that like 40 years ago. This child sacrifice center is open by permission of the church. How many churches are in Springfield? Eugene, I haven't even looked it up. It's dozens upon dozens. Open by permission of the church. This is on us. We are like the priest and the Levite who want to cross the other side of the road to avoid the man that was beaten by robbers. And we, we do something very similar whenever we're driving by abortion mills or driving by abortion doctors or pharmacies that sell abortifacients and we, we drive right by all on the way to the coffee shop to have our personal devotion time with God. Ignoring the plight of the unborn. You know, Israel, we read this passage, Isaiah 1. Israel was engaged in all kinds of religious activity too, just like the church is today. Worship and sacrifices and fastings and prayers. And God says to them, Isaiah 1, I'll look at it again starting at verse 13. If you still have your Bible open, Isaiah 1, verse 13, he says to them, Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They've become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. What should we do, God? Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. That is a serious word from God. How much of our worship and of our prayers does God hate because we close our eyes to the unborn? Because we failed to establish justice for the fatherless for five decades. Repentance starts with us. Abolitionism is church driven. God has commissioned the church to be the ones who go and make disciples and teach them to obey all that Christ has commanded, right? The Great Commission. 
And that mission is not just go get people, individuals saved and, and, and trusting in Christ, right? It's about discipling nations to obey Christ as king and not some earthly Caesar. To bring nations under the kingship of Jesus Christ. And if you ever wondered what you would have been doing if you lived during the Jewish Holocaust or if you lived during the days of chattel slavery here in America, you are doing it right now. Would, would I have been on the right side of history? Most Christians do not want to hear that, obviously. We're okay talking about sin when it's everyone else's sins. But we need to repent and we need to get back to Christianity 101 and we need to love our pre-born neighbors as ourselves. Abortion abolitionism is driven by the church. Fourthly, for your notes, it is immediate and uncompromising. Immediate and uncompromising. Because we believe that life begins at conception and that to destroy that image of God intentionally is murder, we believe the penalty for murder ought to be the same for, for all, as all homicide is. And so we demand immediate abolition of abortion without compromise and without exceptions. Okay? Now, it might come to a surprise to some of you that the pro-life movement, the, the mainline position is that we should allow exceptions for the murder of babies in cases of rape, incest, and the life of the mother. Okay, that is the, the, the run-of-the-mill kind of standard pro-life position. Not every pro-lifer, but, but a lot of the politicians, yes. Donald Trump, he got right in line with the standard pro-life position and said pro-lifers need to, quote, stick together in response to some bills he thought were too extreme that wouldn't allow any exceptions for murdering babies. And he, he tweeted, no, we need to stick together, allow for some exceptions of murder. Listen, here's the biblical position. Never is it okay to intentionally murder a baby. Simple? Never is it okay to intentionally murder a baby. Rape? The baby was conceived in rape. Put the rapist to death, not the baby. Why should the baby pay for the sins of the father? Incest, same thing, right? Life of the mother, there's thousands of medical doctors that unite together to declare unequivocally that there is never a life-threatening situation that would require an abortion. Never. You've been lied to about that, huh? It may be that the child dies in an attempt to save both the life of the mother and the life of the child in rare cases of an ectopic pregnancy or something, but never is there reason to intentionally murder the baby. And so the biblical position is it's never right to kill a baby. God hates the hands that shed innocent blood, listen, including pro-lifers who believe that there should be exceptions for shedding innocent blood. There should be some innocent blood shed. And guess what? Listen, if you are pro-life but believe there should be exceptions, you are actually pro-choice. You believe that in those rare instances, the mother should still be given the choice to murder their babies. You're pro-choice, not pro-life anyways. Abolitionists believe that we should put forth bills that establish equal justice for the unborn immediately, not incrementally or gradually as in the pro-life movement, okay? So you need to understand our current situation is not that the pro-life movement demanded abortion be abolished and they failed 50 years ago and so now they're just taking whatever they can get with these smaller victories. That's not our situation. It's that the pro-life movement failed to even demand the abolition of abortion. They've never asked for it. They've never fought for it. They have chosen instead to establish these incremental bills, regulative bills on abortion. And to understand why this is, you need to understand first the idolatry of judicial supremacy. We are told by pro-life leadership that Roe v. Wade is the supreme law of the land and we simply cannot end abortion because it's been ruled a constitutional right by SCOTUS. Listen, Roe is judicial fiction 
Roe is wicked. Roe is unconstitutional to the core since our inalienable rights from our Creator begin with the right to life. And the amendments, the Fifth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, you shall not be deprived of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. And babies are being put to death without due process of law. It's unconstitutional to the core. But the Supreme Court, we need to understand... They say it's okay. Babies are deprived of life because they said it's okay. But the Supreme Court is not God. The Supreme Court is not supreme. They cannot legalize murder of innocent citizens. They don't have that authority from God, nor do they have that authority in our constitutional republic. And so when man says it's okay to murder and God says it's not, what's our response, church? We obey God rather than man, Acts 5.29. And so SCOTUS must not be submitted to, they must be defied in obedience to God as states rise up and say, no, we will not allow babies to be murdered in our land. Roe v. Wade is not law. It is a Supreme Court opinion, a wicked one at that, and it must be defied. Defied. Not waiting for five decades to get enough Supreme Court justices in there appointed by conservatives so that they hopefully overturn Roe. That is a failed strategy. Both Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey 1982, they were majority, by far majority, appointed conservative justices that established child sacrifice in our land. But pro-life leaders will say you can't defy Roe. We, we, we can't just end abortion because this is our current political system. At the same time, those same politicians, listen to this, those same politicians are ready to nullify against the Supreme Court if if any unconstitutional ruling came down on the Second Amendment. In states that have said we can't nullify Roe v. Wade and protect our own citizens, they said we will if they try to take our guns away. And other states have defied Roe or defied SCOTUS along the way with legalizing marijuana, right? And you got sanctuary cities and states for illegal immigrants. And, you know, so, so we apparently have no problem defying the Supreme Court if it's for guns and drugs. But not if it means protecting innocent babies. Now we're cowards. Now we're scared. They're going to remove our federal funding. We can't touch that. Roe has spoken. And so we're told that the Supreme Court has told us from on high that we cannot abolish abortion. And so what we're told is the best we can do is regulate it and try to make it more difficult or more safe. Not safe for the baby, obviously. And so pro-life legislative victories that we all in this room have supported mean laws that are passed that tell doctors you can't kill babies using forceps. If you're going to kill babies, you've got to use a vacuum or poison. Laws that say you can't kill babies after 20 weeks. But fair game on everyone before that. Laws that say you can't kill a baby once there's a detectable heartbeat. And we're going to trust the hired assassin to find the heartbeat and enforce the law themselves. And any babies before that, fair game. You can kill all the babies without heartbeats. In the end, here's what we've done. We have endorsed murder and we've codified it into law that it is legal to murder babies if you just do it this way and by this level of development and in this kind of facility and as long as you ensure a proper burial after you murder your baby. These are pro-life victories, and it is wicked. God hates these laws that show partiality, which babies to save and which babies die. God hates that. There's no way around it. God hates it. It is evil. But you say, we're trying to save as many lives as possible, and so maybe it's worth it. No, we are seeking to glorify God first. And these are an abomination to God. We can't support that. 
They are sinful decrees. Isaiah 10, verse 1 and 2, God declares curses, not blessings on this kind of incremental victory. He says, woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression, legislators, legislating things that oppress people to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right. The widows may be their spoil and they may make the fatherless their prey. God doesn't say blessed are these laws because at least they saved some. They did some good. No, he says, woe. Woe to those, cursed are those who promote these things. And what what did Paul say about unbelievers slandering the church of Jesus Christ in that kind of way? Romans 3, 8. He says, and why not do evil that good may come as some people slanderously charge us with saying their condemnation is just? Even the accusation of such a thing coming against the church is wicked, right? Far be it, far be it that we would promote evil so that good may come. And yet that is exactly the strategy of pro-life politicians and right to life. It's let's do some evil so that some good may come. And then they tout it out as a victory because it saved some lives. But here's the thing, church, you've been lied to again. The reality is that no pro-life bill has ever technically saved one life. By definition, they have only made it more difficult to procure an abortion, but moms and dads can still kill as many babies as they want. Nothing's stopping them if they just do it earlier, if they do it in this state or that state. Let me ask this, was Moses an incrementalist? When Pharaoh finally says after nine plagues, okay, you can go, you, your women, and your children, only you must leave your livestock. Exodus 10, 26, our livestock also must go with us, not a hoof shall be left behind. We cannot compromise, Moses says. We must demand that you let Yahweh's people go free, and that means with all their belongings too, Pharaoh, sorry. No, we're not making deals here. And yet every pro-life leader would have taken that deal from Pharaoh any day. You take what you can get. We can compromise and God will still bless it, right? God knows that, that we have to take matters into our own hands, right? He can't expect us to trust him to end abortion. He needs us to help him by playing the political game. The duty is ours, church, to obey God and only seek justice, equal justice. The results belong to God, what he's going to do. Another reason the pro-life movement will not abolish abortion is because of this narrative that the women are the second victims. And here's the thing, bills that would criminalize abortion as murder, which is justice in God's eyes, means criminal charges against all who are involved in the murder, including the mothers. Okay? But Abby Johnson, Lila Rose, Scott Klusendorf, the Right to Life leadership, they they would all say that it has never been the position of the pro-life movement that the woman should be charged with murder. They are the victims. And I'm here to declare to you that that is an abomination in God's eyes. That's a perversion of justice. This is not equal justice for the unborn. Listen, if you hold to the belief that a a mom who drowns her newborn infant is culpable of murder, but the woman who pays an assassin to do it just weeks earlier while the baby was still in the womb is somehow a victim, then you're deceived. You're believing lies. This is a perversion of justice. God hates unjust scales and balances. God's law says that the one who shed innocent blood, by man shall his blood be shed. That goes for moms too. They aren't a protected class. This also is the sin of partiality. Now, many will accuse me of lacking mercy. I'm all focused on the justice part, right? What about compassion and mercy for the mothers? And I say, yes, I have that too. And that is why I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to them that they might find eternal salvation and forgiveness, and we offer any assistance we possibly can to help them so that they raise their baby. But the pro-life movement fails to show compassion and mercy for the unborn when they keep protecting the moms as the victims. 
The innocent victims are the babies being poisoned and slaughtered. Moms and dads are perpetrators, not victims. They are murderers. Now, do we have mercy on murderers? Yes, we do, right? But we also believe civil magistrates should punish murderers. It's both and, right? Like if, if, if someone snuck into the back of church this morning off the street and was listening to this and got majorly convicted and, and the Spirit of God brought them regeneration and repentance and they were weeping over their sin and they were talking to some of the pastors after church about wanting to follow Jesus Christ and get baptized and then they confessed to us that they, they, they've been a long time engaged in a sex trafficking ring right here in Roseburg. Well, we would assure them of the promises of God and salvation and forgiveness for His children and, and to trust the Word of God and, and to follow Jesus Christ, but we would also call the police because they've broken the law. See, mercy and justice are not at odds with one another. Okay? We bring mercy in the gospel, and the civil magistrate has a duty to bring justice, to bring order to society. Justice and mercy, of course, meet at the cross of Jesus Christ where he ju- took what we justly deserve so we would receive the mercy we don't deserve. But the pro-life movement perpetuates the narrative of women as the victims. Even in marching, if you look at the photos of the big D.C. March for Life, you know, the, the, the front sign at the front of this you know, mile-long line is, abortion hurts women. That's their message. Abortion hurts women, apparently missing the fact that abortion kills children. As long as they prop up this unbiblical view of justice, they will prevent abortion from being abolished. And that is exactly what the pro-life movement has done. So here comes the shocker. Stay with me. You've been told all these years that the goal that you're supporting financially and that you're voting for, the goal is ending abortion, but it is not. Not for the pro-life movement. They would prefer to see it regulated and perpetuated indefinitely to keep their fundraisers going and you voting for them. Because the truth is, in multiple states, listen to me, Texas, Oklahoma, Indiana, and others, bills that would end abortion completely, without exceptions, criminalizing it as murder, they have been successfully killed, not by pro-choice lobbyists, but by pro-life lobbyists and politicians. You can look into this yourself. For instance, in Oklahoma. Oklahoma has a supermajority Republican pro-life House and Senate and governor. They have all the votes necessary to end the slaughter of thousands of babies that keeps happening every year in their state. They're regulating it with like 1,500 pro-life bills, but, but they will not end it. And this, you know, thousands of babies die every year in their state. And they have worked strategically now multiple years in a row to kill a bill of abolition, to keep it from even being heard on the Senate floor, to even being voted on by others. Instead, they kill it through different strategies to to choose more wicked incremental bills to keep their constituents happy, to make it look like they're doing something to be pro-life and and give themselves awards about it. Tony Lowinger, he's the president of Right to Life Oklahoma, the vice president of National Right to Life, he lobbies against bills of abolition. Abby Johnson, you know, the one the movie Unplanned was about, Roman Catholic, pro-life celebrity, okay? She testifies in Senate hearings in Texas against a bill of abolition, that it would be shot down, a bill that would have ended the deaths of 55,000 babies annually in that state. Establishing justice, shot down. This is so serious, church. If you've been supporting these different organizations, you need to seriously look into this and you can go verify everything that I'm telling you and you will be shocked to the core and I hope you are. I hope you are because these are babies' lives that we're talking about. And they're being used like political footballs. Biblical abolitionists are immediatists because repentance is immediate, not incremental. Think of, think of it like this. Is this pro-life strategy how we would approach any other evil in society? Go with me for a moment. If rape was legal today, rape, would we be saying, let's chip away at rape 
by passing laws that make sure the rapist has to wear a condom. By passing bills that make sure rapists only attack women 30 years and younger. By passing bills that require, they use rape facilities so that at least it's done in a safe and sterile environment. And eventually we want to outlaw rape, but we need permission from the Supreme Court first. And we got to remember, rapists are victims too. We need to think about them. We don't want them to face any actual criminal charges, only get some counseling and maybe some, some rehab treatment because the rapist is the second victim. I mean, they've been duped by the lies of rape culture all these years, and, and uh, they really felt like they had no other choice but to rape all these pressures on them. Do you hear it? It's wicked, foolish nonsense. Repentance is immediate. Jesus says, when your eye causes you to sin, you pluck it out. When your hand causes you to sin, you cut it off. No compromise. No, no cutting back on your adulterous relationship to just two times a month and, and then back to one time a month, right? No, you cut it off. You repent now. And that's what we need. That's what we ought to be saying to the civil magistrates. Repent and end abortion now. All of it because it is never right to murder a baby. The differences here from what I'm saying and the pro-life movement are major. They are major. And that's why last Sunday some of you were wondering, why don't we just march with the Douglas County right to life? They did a march last Sunday. Listen, it's because right to life is opposed to abolishing abortion and therefore God is opposed to right to life. As simple as I can state it. Now, we didn't intend to cross paths with the, the mar March for Life last Sunday. Sunday, but we did at the end of our outreach there on Garden Valley on the Four Corners. We had 60 Wellspringers out there taking a courageous stand that was impossible for our city to ignore. Hallelujah. And, and along came the Right to Life March led by another local pastor. And when they saw us, they decided to change their route and cut through the parking lot of the Carl's Jr. and come out way over by past the steakhouse over there. And so they, they physically divided themselves from our group. They didn't, they didn't want to be confused with us and our stand for the unborn, which seems a little strange on their part, right? Because isn't this the big ecumenical movement, the big tent, everyone's included? If you'll stand for life, you can be part of this, right? Except for true brothers and sisters in Christ who are going to call abortion murder and preach the gospel. That can't be a part of. I emailed the leader of DC Right to Life, also the pastor who was leading the group. Again, remember, leading them from the Catholic hospital to the Seventh-day Adventist cult to have a prayer time together, okay? And their response was, we disagree with your messaging, and we think ours is more effective. And so they will yoke themselves with, again, other false gospels and cults and humanists and LGBT, as long as they get in line with the pro-life messaging, but a church of Christians that is taking a bold stand with God's law and gospel, they will physically avoid so as to not be confused with us because we don't line up with the messaging. And you know what? That's fine on our part, obviously, as you heard this morning, but we're not working toward the same goal. We don't have the same foundation of the gospel. We're seeking immediate abolition of abortion, criminalizing it as murder with no compromises. That's what we're after. Which brings me to lastly, number five for your notes and quickly here. Abortion abolitionism trusts in the providence of God. We trust in the providence of God. I think this is a great spot to end because a lot of thoughts are going through your mind about how to actually get this done, right? The constant argument is that you can't just preach the gospel. You can't, you can't just call mothers and fathers and legislators and churches to repentance. You can't just pass bills of immediate abolition without exception and compromise. You can't just do that. Why? Because it won't work. It won't work. Ultimately, all of the arguments by pro-lifers like Scott Klusendorf and others, arguments against what I'm presenting this morning, abolitionism, they are based on an argument from pragmatism. What we think will work. What we think will be effective. And not one scripture is brought to bear because ultimately you can't defend pro-lifeism biblically. 
You have to defend it based on the wisdom of man and the pragmatism of man. But abolitionists, what? We trust in the providence of God, not the wisdom or pragmatism of man. The abolitionist cry is, duty is ours, results belong to God. God is sovereign. We trust him. We will do as he pleases. We must only be faithful to him, completely, fully, uncompromisingly faithful and obedient to him. Duties are as results belong to God. When we talk about the providence of God, what we mean is God sovereignly working his will through the faithful obedience and faith of his people. Ephesians 1.11. We are called to be obedient and trust him for what happens. Okay, just like Gideon and his 300 soldiers against 115,000 Midianites, right? Moabites. That makes no sense. We trust in Yahweh. Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Now, pro-lifeism has thousands of reasons why we, we can't just we got to keep the gospel out of it because it doesn't work, and we need to include as many people as possible to, to have any kind of success. We need the 115,000 soldiers, right, if we want any chance at success. We must take exceptions, or we'll never get anything passed to limit abortion. We must only pass incremental bills because we, we don't want to risk the Supreme Court overturning everything we've done, and we must do evil that some good may come. Because that's politics. And the abolitionist says, no, we must obey God no matter what and glorify him first. And that church is our only hope of God supernaturally bringing a revival that would end the wickedness in our state, in our nation, and in this world. Now, he may choose to not bring that revival. Again, we trust the providence of God. The duty is ours. The results belong to him. Church family, it is time that we forsake these compromised pro-life leaders, this pro-life movement, and that we embrace abortion abolitionism, biblical abolitionism. It's time that we stop supporting candidates and bills that will not treat abortion like murder and establish equal justice. If you give to politicians the option to abolish abortion or to delay justice through incremental bills, they will choose the easier route every time. No more. We must demand it. We must speak prophetically to the civil magistrates and tell them what God has said about the unborn, what God says about justice, and we must demand that they put forth bills of abolition or we will not support them anymore. I know this might feel like a David versus Goliath kind of a fight, but remember what God did through the young man David because he was zealous for the honor of Yahweh. Are you zealous for the honor of Yahweh? One of you. In Oregon, we have a long way to go, but take hope, church. 18 states this year have bills of abolition in the works by state senators and congressmen who are courageously taking a stand for equal justice for the unborn. And they are being opposed by the pro-life movement at every turn. But you got to take hope, again, that we remember the pro-abort and the pro-life, they're built on sand. They're not built on the rock of obedience to God's word. The winds are going to blow. The waves are going to hit that house. It's going to come crashing down, and great will be the fall of it, and abortion will be abolished. Okay? And listen to this. History will prove that the Christian abolitionist fanatics were the sane ones who did what was right no matter the cost. Now, we need to live consistently as biblical abolitionists. That means we consistently are against all baby murder, whether through IVF or hormonal birth control and IUDs. We need to be consistent against all baby murder research in a lot of our vaccines today. We need to be consistently praying for the unborn and going to rescue them who are stumbling toward the slaughter and interposing at these places of death in our nation. And we need to bring an awakening of what God thinks of abortion to our culture, on the streets, at the schools, in our workplaces, at the Capitol. That is what it looks like to be Christian living in the midst of child sacrifice. Now, if you have questions, concerns, arguments for why we should still support pro-life candidates, I, I just encourage you to please be willing to speak with me. You could stop by the table after church and talk with one of the volunteers to get some answers to the questions, to have some back and forth, because, again, this matters that much. It's worth that extra effort to get your questions and doubts answered. Let's pray together.
Our Lord, we know that we are up against Goliath here, and you are our mighty Savior. You are our victor. The victory is already yours, God, and all that Satan is working to do in our midst. He's on your leash, and he is ultimately only fulfilling your purposes for the big picture, to bring you glory, to establish your kingdom here on the earth. And we look forward to the day that Satan is bound for a thousand years and your kingdom is here in its fullness and righteousness and peace pervade the whole earth. We long for it and we say, come soon, Lord Jesus. And yet in the meantime, Lord, help us be faithful. Should you tarry, help us be faithful. Help us to have our lamps lit, full of oil. Help us to be ready. Help us to be about your business. Help us to be about the duty trusting in you for the results. Lord, I do pray your spirit blow through this place like the wind and do your work in our hearts. We ask this for your glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Let's stand and respond with one song of praise. Come back tonight, six o'clock for the documentary. Once was lost. I once was lost in darkest night. Yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and light had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not love me first I would refuse you still hallelujah all I have is Christ hallelujah Jesus is my As I ran, my hell-bound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state, it led me to the cross, and I beheld God's love displayed, you suffered in place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is great. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah.
Son of God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one risen Son. together as church. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Have a great week, folks.